okay. <laughs> so we've been following Ezra as he led the, the second wave of exiles back to Jerusalem. We're going to be at Ezra chapter 9 here in just a few minutes. Now we know from a study we've done that they arrived safely in a timely manner. And Ezra said that was because the hand of our God was upon us. They traveled under God's protection. And then once they got there, Ezra immediately set to work to put everything in order. He had to disperse all the money and the treasures that the king had sent. Um, he appointed spiritual leaders to lead in the temple and to teach the people. Um, and he guided them in worship. And there were many other tasks that he had to do. He had that letter. Remember the king gave him that, that official document. And he had to take that around to all the, the governors and the different areas there to make sure that they, number one, supported the temple, everything they needed to make that happen. And number two, that they didn't tax them or require them to pay tribute to, to the governors themselves. So he had all of that that he did. Plus, he had to figure out a place to live for himself and, and set up a home and all the others. Now, that time frame... From the time they got back to Jerusalem on this travel, it took about four months, give or take a little bit, to get all this nailed down and everything handled that he had to take care of. So, um, at that, and then he had to he had to get busy putting the finishing touches to the temple. Remember, the king had given him some more of the the worship instruments, some gold and stuff that had been taken from the temple when they went into exile. So he had to get that all put back in place as well. And his, his most important task, the reason Ezra was sent back, was he was to begin rebuilding the people. Okay? Uh, Zerubbabel and, and some of the others that had, had worked, they did the bulk of the work rebuilding the altar and rebuilding the temple. But God sent Ezra, who was a priest, to begin rebuilding the people in, as a person and, as, as, and personally, as they stacked up, made the nation. Okay. So that sounds relatively easy, doesn't it? Just to preach and teach and, you know, hang out at the church and, and talk to people in the temple and stuff. So it should be, you would think, as you read the scripture, a time of peace and quiet and easy living, right? But the scripture, from the scripture, we know that doesn't happen, okay? So before Ezra can even get rolling, he's hit with bad news. Many of the Jews had married foreign spouses. Now remember, one of the deals that the king did back then, when he conquered a territory, he would move most of the people from that territory out, and he would move other people back in. Okay? And one, that's part of the way that they controlled people. There was constant chaos. And with that, they brought all kinds of uh, different beliefs, different religions, different ways of worship, and that's what created part of the problem that Jerusalem went into the Israel, the nation of Israel, excuse me, went into captivity was because they've been they began following foreign gods. Okay? They began worshiping in an improper manner. So that's part of the problem. So the Jews had been uh, marrying foreign spouses. That was against God's command. Okay? And we know for a fact, that was the very thing that started their decline. Okay? Now we're going to take a look at the scripture and then we'll go back and, and see what the scripture's got to say about it. Let's look at Ezra chapter 9, verses 1 through 15. After these things had been done, the officials approached me and said, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands with their abominations from the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Prezerites, is what it is, and the Jebusites, and the Ammonites, and the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken some of their daughters to be wives for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy race has mixed itself with the peoples of the lands. And in this faithlessness, the hand of the officials and the chief men has been foremost. As soon as I heard this, I tore my garment and my cloak and pulled hair from my head and beard and sat appalled. 
Then all who trembled at the words of, God, of the God of Israel because of the faithlessness of the returned exiles gathered round me while I sat appalled until the evening service. And in the evening service, I rose from my fasting with my garment and my cloak torn and fell upon my knees and spread out my hands to the Lord my God saying, O oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift my face to you, my God, for our iniquities have risen higher than our heads. Excuse me. <coughs> and our guilt has mounted up to the heavens. From the days of our fathers to this day, we have been in great guilt. And for our iniquities, we, our kings and our priests, have been given into the hands of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to captivity, to plundering, and to utter shame, as it is today. But now, for a brief moment, favor has been shown by the Lord our God to leave us a remnant and to give us a secure hold within this holy place, that our God might brighten our eyes and grant us a little reviving in our slavery. For we are slaves, yet our God has not forsaken us in our slavery, but has extended to us his steadfast love before the kings of Persia, to grant us some reviving to set up the house of our God to repair its ruins, and to give us protection in Judah and in Jerusalem. And now, our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken your commandments, which you commanded by your servants, the prophets, saying, the land that you are entering to take possession of, it is a land impure with the impurity of the peoples of the land, with their abominations that have filled it from end to end with their uncleanness. Therefore, do not give your daughters to their sons, neither take their daughters for your sons, and never seek their peace or prosperity, that you may be strong and eat the good of the land and leave it for an inheritance to your children forever. After, and after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great guilt, seeing that you, our God, have punished us less than our iniquities deserve and have given us such a remnant as this, Shall we break your commandments again and intermarry with the peoples who practice these abominations? Would you not be angry with us until you consumed us, so that there should be no remnant nor any escape? O Lord, the God of Israel, you are just, for you are left, for we are left a remnant that has escaped, as it is today. Behold, we are before you in our guilt, for none can stand before you because of this. So when Ezra heard this, he immediately went to prayer. Okay? It was on his knees. We'll, we'll talk about this. But it's important. Uh, uh, let me just start. I'll get ahead of myself here. Sorry. Okay. Verse 1, it says, when these things were done, we spoke about that in the opening. The list of things that Ezra had to complete when he got there. The priests and the Levites, it said, the spiritual leaders were implicated as well as the people. That shows us just how extensive the evil and the sin was that they were involved in. So, and it was serious because it went all the way up from the, the common guy that was working the job all the way up through the temple to the priests and the Levites. The Lord had commanded his people to keep themselves apart from the people of Canaan, okay, Canaan, where they arrived in the, in the promised land is where he's talking about. In fact, he even ordered them to make war against many of the pagan nations to destroy their altars and their religious sites that were dedicated to their false gods. Now, there's scripture to back this up. In Exodus chapter 34, Exodus 34, verses 10 through 16. Exodus 34, 16. And he said, speaking of the Lord, Behold, I am making a covenant before all your people. I will do marvels such as have not been created in all earth or in any nation. And all the people among whom you are, among whom you are, shall see the work of the Lord. For it is an awesome thing that I will do with you. Observe what I command you this day. Behold, I will drive out before you the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Take care, at least you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land to which you go. At least it become a snare in your midst. You shall tear down their altars, 
break their pillars, and cut down their ashram. For you shall worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous god. Least you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and when they whore after their gods and sacrifice to their gods, and you are invited to eat of this sacrifice, and you take of their goddess for your sons, and their goddess whore after their gods, and make your sons whore after their gods. See, he knew if they mixed, they would chase the other gods. And it's also in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. It's entitled, The Chosen People. When the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering to take possession of it and clears away many nations before you, the Hittites, the Gershishites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Prezerites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations more numerous and mightier than you, and when the Lord your God gives them over to you, you defeat them. Then you must devote them to complete destruction. You shall make no covenant with them, show no mercy to them, you shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons. For they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you, and he would destroy you quickly. But thus you shall deal with them. You shall break down their altars and dash in pieces their pillars and chop down their ashram and burn their carved images with fire. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. So God commanded the Israelites not to intermarry, not to become one with the people that were in Canaan when he, he led them into the promised land. Now it's kind of a sad statement on the human condition to see that the returning Jews immediately begin to repeat the former sin. Remember, these people just spent 70 years in exile. It's not like they got their hands slapped and, and God said, don't do that anymore. They were severely punished for the way they lived. But immediately upon returning home, they fall right back into their old ways. Now, in Proverbs 26, in verse 11, Solomon writes this. Like a dog that returns to his vomit is a fool who repeats his folly. It's a human condition to continue to go back to what we know. Now Solomon would have known about this, right? Because he committed the same sin. We, on Thursday night we've been studying uh, the book of Ecclesiastes. And uh, it's all about what Solomon wrote about having lived this way. One time a uh, uh, a confirmed, committed man of God. But because of his concubines and his hundreds of wives and the women that he had who were foreign women, they drew him away from serving God to following the false gods in their way. So there was a reason. Now, that's not to say nothing bad about women. Don't go there, ladies, okay? We've got to clear that up right away. But Satan used these women to bring down the nation that God chose as, as his own. It, it, it was their beliefs that, that, that they followed. So in verse 2, we see that they have taken some of their daughters to be their wives for themselves and their sons so that the holy race was mixed with the peoples. Some have taken their daughters and their wives. The prophet Malachi he, he spoke to this, that some of, the, some of these guys actually divorced their Jewish wives and married a foreign woman. Now, why would they do that? Well, some, some say uh, they were more promiscuous. Remember, some of these uh, false uh, temples in that, there was prostitution, there was drug use, there was, you know, high old party time as they went to worship. It was completely different than, than worshiping our sovereign God the way he, he desired to be worshipped. So some of them left and went to that. You got, and the other thing is the Jews were still living at that time under all those rules and stuff. Well, there's like 635 rules that uh, they had that they had to follow. So to be able to, to leave that, leave your wife behind and, and divorce her and, and marry a foreign woman who's, their, all their worship service was, was a party. 
But uh, for the weakened guy, that would be a pretty good call, wouldn't it? And that same weakened call happens in our world today, just so we know. It's not just them. Okay? But Malachi says this. In Malachi chapter 2 and verse 11, Judah has been faithless, and the abominations have been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord which he loves and has married the daughter of a foreign god. And then in, in verse 14 and 16, they're talking about now that God wouldn't accept their sacrifices. And it's in verse 14 it says, But you say, why does he not? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Did he not make them one with a portion of a spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourself in your spirit and do not be faithless. So, God intended for the nation of Israel to stay pure. That's what this is all about. He intended for them to stay pure. But they decided they would rather marry these foreign women and follow their worship service, and they became unpure. Okay? And there's a reason for that. It says in verse 2 of Ezra 9, They, they took their wives for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy race was mixed. The holy race. Some translations use the term the holy seed. Because we have to remember, to, uh, God here, and we need to be clear that the Bible is not talking about anything like racism or discrimination based on ethnicity. He is not. The Lord had chosen Abraham and his descendants to be the race into which he would bring Jesus, the Messiah, his holy and sinless son. And because the Lord wanted Abraham's descendants to be set apart as a holy people, distinct and different from the world around them, rather than blending in. And when they, they took these other wives, they were blending in. <clears throat> they were no longer distinctive in their, their Jewish culture. And the thing that the holiness that God had called them to. Excuse me. Now, why do we study this Old Testament stuff? Because the same principle applies today. God's people, the Christian church, is the bride of Christ. The Lord still demands that the bride keep herself apart from the world. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14 <coughs> says this. 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 14. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ would be out? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? God calls us today to be holy. Remember, if Jesus is your savior today, you're part of a holy priesthood. We're set aside for God's use. So, Ezra gets this news. And now we know the reason why he's upset. And in verse 3, it says, <clears throat> As soon as I heard this, I tore my garment and my cloak and pulled hair from my head and beard and said, Paul. That's his response. And that's a, that was one of their traditions for expressing extreme grief or sorrow. Remember Job? In, in the book of Job, when Job got all the bad news about losing everything, it said he uh, he pulled part of his beard out, and some. And uh, when it says they pulled their hair out, sometimes they mean they, they messed it all up. They ripped their clothes, and, and Job sat in ashes, sat on the ground. It's an expression 
of extreme grief. And that was what he was doing. It's a sign of degrading oneself or humbling oneself in sorrow. And Ezra did that over the sin of the nation. Verse 4 tells us, though, that there were those. Then all who trembled at the words of the God of Israel because of the faithfulness, faithlessness of the returned exiles gathered around me while I sat appalled at the Indian <coughs> service. Everyone who trembled, those are the believers who were following God's word and God's ways. They stuck there. And, and by setting with Ezra, when they sat down, they made a public proclamation or statement that they were not joining the group who sinned, and they did not support them. See, if, if God's people refuse to repent, to separate themselves from the world, then those who still fear God's word will separate themselves from them. And we have to be conscious of that. Just because someone says they're a Christian and they go to church on Sunday and that doesn't mean they're living by God's word. And we have to watch that when we go out into the world when we leave here. And by our testimony, we are to stand separate from We're not to be in agreement with them. We can point out they're wrong to them, but if they refuse to repent of it, then we need to step away. And that happens in our life, doesn't it? I don't know about you, but when I began to be serious about tracking with the Lord, I lost people out of my life. There's people in my family who don't particularly care for me. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> you know, that's happened. They didn't care for me the way I was before either, so I guess that's okay, right? But if I stand for righteousness, if I stand for God, I will step away from their wrong doing. So we have to be conscious of that. God still requires that of us, not just the Israelites. In verse 5 through 15, Ezra's prayer of confession. It says that when he went to the evening service and the folks went with him, it says that he fell upon his knees and spread out his hands to the Lord. My God saying, oh my God, I'm ashamed and I blush to lift up my face to my God for our iniquities have risen above our head and our guilt is mounted up to the heavens. <coughs> Let me ask you this. When you hear about our world, or maybe not even take in the whole world, what about our community? The things that happen there. The things that are going on in the house down the street or whatever. Do you go before God and pray about that? Do you commit yourself to that? Do you grieve for those who are in sin? One of the things we need to recognize is that when Ezra prayed this prayer, he didn't say, God, I'm surrounded by a group of sinners. He said, we and us. He included himself in that prayer. He was demonstrating an important element of spiritual leadership by identifying himself with the entire body of God's people. And remember that he too was a sinner. He may not have been participating in that, but he still had issues. And with weeping, he expressed shame for the sin. He expressed fear of the consequences and a desire for the people to repent. Within this prayer, <clears throat> Ezra is, is reminded and recognizes the fact that he lets God know that he, he knows. And he's letting the people know. Because you can be sure this was not a silent prayer. He's on his knees with his hands spread out, weeping before God. He's pouring it out at the altar there. He reminds the people just how much mercy and grace God showed them to this point. He had took the Lord had turned the king's heart towards them. He made the trip safe. He saved the remnant that went back to Jerusalem. And he continued to protect them. See, Ezra knew and recognize the fact that if true justice prevailed, 
without any mercy, none of them would have survived. None of them would have survived going into captivity in the first place. And they'd have never come back. No one would have been able to stand before God in his holy presence. Ezra knew he was praying the Jewish people would recognize that God was calling them to be a holy community. A holy community. That's what God called them to be in the first place. And Ezra is reminding them of that. God has a purpose for us. Help us to remember that. You know, God still wants a community, a holy community, to love and to serve him. He still wants a holy community to take care of his business here. Now, one of the things that we can take from this you know, remember here a few weeks ago that lady stopped by from Allegan and dropped off that prayer sheet. I mentioned it to you a couple times uh, about uh, 2 Chronicles 7.14, praying for our nation, right? That's what Ezra's doing here. You can put his prayer here right on top of, of that, and they line right up. You can, you can take what Ezra has recognized as sin in his nation and put it right on top of where we're at in our world today, and it lines right up. Okay? The, here's what we can take from this. The sins of a nation are corrected by the people recognizing and repenting of their sins. The sins of a nation are corrected by the people recognizing and repenting of their personal sin. Now we know here a while back, before we started this study, we just finished that study of the respectable sins, right? And we know that within all of our lives, everybody sitting here, we have some issues here and there, right? And we have some things that we don't take care of. They may be all un unintentional, but we still commit those sins. We need to go to God and ask for his help with that. You know, um, that prayer, we, we continue to pray for our nation, right? We do on Thursday nights when we do our prayer time uh, before the study. We ask God to help the United States of America become one nation under God again. That we'd be under his control. We'd be able to feel his hand upon this nation and upon the leaders here. Well, how does that begin? It begins just like Ezra prayed. That every one of us will take care of our personal business with God. And we will get right with it. And we will recognize the sin. We will confess that sin. And we will repent of it. We will turn away from it. Listen to Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, beginning there. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Verse 15, now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer that is made in this place. For now I have chosen and consecrated this house that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there for all time. If we go to God, confess with sincerity the sin in our life and ask him to relieve us of that, forgive us of that in Jesus' name, and to help us not do it anymore. Realize God doesn't expect us to turn ourselves around. When he sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross of Calvary to pay our sin debt, and we accepted that by faith, and he become our personal Savior, he had dwelt us with the Holy Spirit. And that's how we have the power to make these changes. We have to ask God, God, help me. Help me, number one, to recognize the sin in my life. Number two, help me to confess it. And then please, help me to repent of it, to turn away from it. And you know what? If every person here did that and lived a righteous life, the people in your sphere of influence will recognize that. They will. Your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, if that's where you're at in life, your neighbors, your brothers and sisters, and then as that spreads, as that spreads, the world begins to change. How does that happen? Well, as we follow God's word, we vote different, right? 
not so much about what it does for my wallet, but what does it do for God's kingdom? My wallet. We use this as a guide to do that. God's called us to be a holy community. He's called us to live righteous, to live by his word, to pray, to praise him, to follow the ordinances. Yes, we, we're not Israel, uh, and you know, we are not the nation of Israel. We're the New Testament church of Jesus Christ. But as we've seen from scripture, God has called us to be his holy community, yeah. to be his voice in this lost and dying world right now. We're called to that. And we need to honor that. Because one day, as Pastor Kurt said earlier, you don't have to answer to me. But the scripture tells us that every one of us, when we leave this life, will stand before God. And we will answer for what we did while in the body, whether good or bad. And I, for one, and I pray you as well, want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Not that I give you all them chances and you didn't pay attention. I've heard that enough in my life now. I don't need to hear it when I stand before the Lord. So please take that to heart. Ask God to help you. He will. He wants, he wants us to call upon you. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning, and Lord, we do so thank you and praise you that we have the examples in Scripture to see, Lord, how you called that nation of Israel to be your people. But Father, you've also called us as you pulled upon our hearts and drew us to Jesus Christ to recognize him as our Lord and Savior and we become part of your family. And Father, we're called to serve your kingdom and to do that properly. We need to stand in righteousness. And Father, I pray that you help each and every one of us, beginning with me, Father, that you would help us to have a heart that's sensitive that when the Holy Spirit prompts us to take a step forward or to step away from a situation, the Father, we'd be able to recognize that and we'd be obedient to it. Father, it's the desire of our heart to become more like your Son, Jesus Christ. That every time we come here and we open your word, Father, that we take a step closer to his Christ-likeness as we seek to disciple after him. Father, we thank you for the opportunities you give us. Father, we thank you for the folks that are following the, the church's ordinance in baptism today. I pray, Lord God, your hand be upon them, that you would put a fire in their heart to study your word and to recognize and to know this and to seek to change. And through that, Father, the world will become one more person closer to righteousness, to become the country here in America that you called us and established it to be. Father, we love you. We adore you. We thank you and praise you for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.